or the end of the movie is always the climax. It's, we're always waiting for the ending. Some of us even turn to the ending to know the, the end of the story before we even start the story. I mean, if we are ever reading books. Nowadays, very few people read books. So it's always the climax. The bad guy is exposed. The bad guy is defeated. The good guys win. Or, and most of the time, is they live happily ever after. So today, we come to the end of the book of Acts. And we will find out whether or not the book actually ends with everybody living happily ever after. Because every aspect of the apostles' lives, Peter, James, John, and especially Paul and his followers, it has been very dramatic, very exciting, as well as harrowing, even to the point of almost death, to say the least. But it will soon come to an end, at least according to Luke, the writer, because Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. The lesson today will start off with the treacherous journey to Rome. Rome is the capital city of Italy. Rome is also the resident city of the Kaiser or, the, or Caesar himself. So they're going to bring Paul now from Caesarea all the way to Rome. So if you look at the white, the green, and the yellow, these were the missionary journeys that we learned about Paul. If you start with the white color, white color was the first missionary journey. It's actually noted in Acts 13, where he started with Barnabas. Paul started his second missionary journey with Silas. That is the yellow color. This is where he went around. He picked up Timothy along the way. And then he went to Philippi, he went to Thessalonica, he went to Athens, he went to Corinth. And then he picked up Priscilla and Aquila and left them in Ephesus. Then he went back towards Syria, which is the Jerusalem site. This is second missionary journey. Then most of us will remember the third missionary journey, which is just recently, where he started off, he stopped in Ephesus. He spent three years there. There was a lot of big hoo-ha there. He went to Macedonia. He had to make a U-turn because they were, they were going to kill him. And finally, he didn't want to stop in Ephesus. He was rushing to go to Jerusalem for the Pentecost. So today will be his fourth journey, but not a missionary journey. It would be a journey to defend himself in front of the Kaiser or Caesar. In verse 1, and when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, the there. So they handed him over to this guy called Julius, the centurion officer. He's the commander. So he was in charge of bringing Paul and some other prisoners all the way to Rome. He says that they say they put out to the sea and sail under the lee. Under the lee is they had to go around this island called Cyprus. You see that Cyprus island with Paphos and Sal Salamis? They went around because of the high winds. So they were in the protection of the island of Cyprus. They reached this port called Myla. Then the centurion found a ship that was going to bring them to Rome. Then after that, they started off their journey. They went south to this island called Crete. And what happens after that? The weather was getting too dangerous for the sea. And uh, Paul had to caution the ship officers on the, on, the, on the ship by saying, there's trouble ahead if they sailed further. But the ship captain already made up his mind to set forth to Phoenix because it is a safer harbor. Unfortunately, the ship got swept and blown off their direction out to the sea by a typhoon called Nor Northeaster. The sailors couldn't turn against the wind so they bound the ropes around the hull and lowered the anchor to slow the ship down. The wind, however, continued to rage and battered the ship for many days. You know, they could not even see the sun or the moon, you know, until the cargo and ship gears were thrown out of the ship. And, and in the course, they had not eaten for a very long time. Paul, at this time, brought forward a relieving news that an angel had appeared to him that the night before, and he said that at the kind of fear, they must be so fearful that Paul encouraged them to, hey, you know, eat, you know, because they did not eat for a long time. And he too ate with them by giving thanks to God and assured them that their life will be safe, that all 276 on board was safe. And later they went throwing about the wheat cargo 
further to lighten the ship. Thank you, Alinda. Verse 9 says that since considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because the fast was already over. What does it mean? What did Luke mean by that the fast was already over? Basically, the fast of the Day of Atonement. So Paul was keeper of the law as well as all still the festivals of the Jewish people or the Jewish religion. That is around October. So it's, winter is coming and the seas are getting quite treacherous. Here, they stop in Fairhaven and Paul said, no, don't go because it's dangerous. But they decided to go. They thought they would reach Phoenix. But you see, Fairhaven and Phoenix is so nearby. The hurricane brought them all the way almost down south to North Africa, to a place that had what they call the, the Sirtis, right? The Sirtis, which are basically sandbars. That means they would be stuck in the sand near. That's where they spent many, many days at sea in the storm, in the storm. And they threw out the cargo, they threw out everything because they wanted to lighten the load of the ship so that ship can float even better. Don't forget that Arinda told us there's 276 people on board. So it's not a small ship, it's a huge ship. And these guys were hungry, they were seasick, they didn't eat. And Paul said, no, you have to eat because you must listen to me. Why you must listen to me? Because the angel came to me, an angel of the Lord whom I belong to. So all, all these people were most likely non-Christian. So here was Paul declaring, look, my God came to me through an angel and tell me, don't be afraid, Paul, right? Because your purpose is for you to stand in front of Caesar. And God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. So it's very good to associate with people who are in the purpose of God people who are in the purpose of God, you will be protected. So the whole ship, the 276 people will be safe, even though they made the wrong decision because they were with Paul. Therefore, keep your courage, man, for I believe God will turn up exactly as I have been told. Be at the ground in a certain island. God's purpose for your life is greater than any setback you will ever go through. Always remember this story. Whatever storms, whatever hurricane, whatever shipwreck, whatever it is, if your life is in God's purpose, it will be greater than any setback, any COVID, any finance, anything that you will ever go through. And it's also important to be surrounded or with the people of God who are in the purpose or in his purpose. So perhaps instead of praying for God to bless our plans, we should pray we are in God's purpose rather than we organize and then we say, God, please bless us. Please help us to organize. Please bless this program. Please bless that program. Rather than we really seek to know God's purpose, then our life can go in confidence. We don't see Paul praying so much, you know. He just continued to behave and to act according to God's instruction. And he was a motivating factor to the people around him, even to the fact that he broke bread and he prayed and everybody ate. So what happens after that? Now they are right in the middle of the sea, tossed around in the sea. Let's hear from Tim Alex. They like came. They did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a beach and they intended to run the ship ashore. So they did all whatever is possible, whatever was necessary to finally bring the ship to shore. The soldiers had a plan to kill the prisoners for fear that they would swim away and escape. But the centurion wishing to save Paul stopped them from that purpose. And so all of them, and so all of them came safely to the shore. And once they were ashore, they learned that the island was called Malta. And the natives were the natives of Malta were extraordinarily kind to them and they lit a bonfire for them because it was cold and because it, because it was cold after the rain. So Paul was gathering firewood for the for bonfire when one of the bundles of the wood, a wiper came out clung to his hand. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and was totally unharmed. So when the natives saw this, they expected Paul to be poisoned and fall dead. 
suddenly. But after waiting for a long time and saw that nothing happened to him, they changed their mind and began to say that Paul was a god. In the neighborhood of that place was an estate belonging to a leading man of the island. His name was called Publius. Publius welcomed, all, uh, welcomed and entertained all this uh, Paul and his companions for three days. And it so happened that Publius' father was ill. He was suffering from fever and from dysentery. So Paul visited him. He prayed and laid his hand on him and cured Publius' father. The rest of the natives from the island who had ailments also came and all of them were healed. So they all were very happy and they heaped many honors upon them. And when Paul and his company left, they gave, the Maltese gave them supplies for all their needs. Do you know that because of Paul again, the centurion, see the guy at the back there, that's a centurion, the head of the commander of the unit, says, no, don't kill them, let them go. So because of that, the prisoners were safe. After that, they swam, those that can swim, swim to shore. Those that couldn't swim, they have to take the piece of wood off the shore to an island called, Cindy said, Malta to an island called Malta. So where's Malta? Does Malta still exist today? Yes, you can visit Malta. He didn't know, but the angel told Paul already he's going to land in an island, and sure enough, the island was Malta. Local inhabitants, in verse 2, showed them extreme kindness because they had seen all these people come out in the rain and in the cold. They helped them and they built a bonfire for them. They stayed there for three months in Malta because there's no ship. They continue their journey. So in the meantime, Paul also could witness and evangelize and heal and help these people there through Publus, which, uh, which is a chief official whose father was sick. And then Paul went in, laid hands on him and healed him. People on the island who were sick also came and were healed. They were also bestowed many honors. It means that Paul became like a hero. After three months, they are able now to continue their journey. What happens from now on? So after three months in sail in an Alexandrian ship, where Paul moved from Malta to Syracus, where they stayed for three days. Then they reached to Region, and one, of, and then one day later to Puteoli. There it goes where Paul first interviewed with the Roman Jews. He gathered the leaders and says, brothers, Although I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of Romans. After they examined me, they wanted to release me since I had not committed a capital offense. Paul was compelled to appeal to Kaiser. For this reason, Paul was asked to see and speak to them. In fact, it is for the hope of the Israel that Paul was wearing this chain. The leaders mentioned that they have never received any letter about Paul in Judea. No one reported or spoke <coughs> anything evil about Paul. And they were willing to hear and understand the situation from him. The response of Paul's message, many come to Paul in his lodging where he expounded and witnessed about the kingdom of God from dawn to dusk. He persuaded them concerning on Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some believers, some beliefs, and the others do not. Known to you that this saving work of God has been sent to the Gentiles, they will listen. That's what Paul says. After he said this thing, the Jews departed while engaging in a prolonged debate among themselves. So after three months from Malta, finally, after going to Syracuse, go Regium, Potioli, Three inns. Finally, he reached Rome. Do you know what he did in Rome? The 28, verse 26 to 20, 27, 27. Go to these people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For these people's heart has become closed. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, 
and I would heal them. This was taken from prophet Isaiah in a, in a book of Isaiah 6, 6, 9 to 13. In verse 17, after three days, he started to get to work. So after three days, what did he do? Ben told us he called the local Jews. Now, in Rome, there are also again, Jewish leaders there and Paul called them together. When they had assembled, he talked to them about his experience in Jerusalem that has just happened. How he was accused, how he was put to trial, how they wanted to kill him and wanted to issue a death sentence on him. I was forced to appeal to Caesar or Kaiser. Not that I had some charge to bring against my own people because for my own sake, my own life, I have to appeal to Caesar. And verse 20, for this reason, I've asked to see and speak to you all. For I'm bound with this chain because of the hope of Israel. Wow. The Jews in Rome were a bit surprised because they did not receive any communication, any letters, any email, anything regarding what happened in Jerusalem. They were quite isolated from Jerusalem, which is something that is good. They were probably just practicing Jews, faithful practicing Jews, not influenced by the Pharisees or the jealous Pharisees in Jerusalem. So they say, we have not heard anything about you or anything bad about you, but we would like to hear about it. We would like to know what is this sect, this Christian group that has been going around that people everywhere are speaking against. They set a date. They set a date for Paul to meet and they came in great numbers to hear from him. This is in verse 23. Verse 23, they set a date and now Paul had to now testify. Imagine coming after um, so many months of experience in, in, at sea, three days later, now Paul is evangelizing, sharing the gospel, teaching them, testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. From what? from the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning until evening. Look at how, how committed and dedicated Paul is to his mission and his purpose. It says here in 424, some were convinced, but others refused to believe. That's why just now Ben read about the verse, the prophetic verse from Acts that says that they will hear, but they will not understand in verse 26. They will keep on looking, but they will never perceive, blinded by their own perception, their own religious understanding, and their biases, and of course, their political reasons. So, at the end, he says in verse 28, salvation from, the God, from God has been sent to the Gentiles. So, that when we are doing witnessing or when we're sharing the word of God, don't expect everybody to understand or to accept. So, it's okay. All we have to do is to share. All we have to do is to invite. All we have to do is to catch an opportunity. Verse 30 is the last verse of the book of Acts. It seems to stop very abruptly. So verse 30. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome for his own expense. At his own expense, he welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. How do you like the ending of the book of Acts? It just seems to float there. Paul lived there two whole years in his own rented quarters and welcomed all who came. So it doesn't mean it doesn't seem like he was in prison. He rented his own rented quarters. Perhaps he was in chains, he had guards and all that. And he was proclaiming to the king, to people, whoever was coming to him, the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with complete, my version says complete boldness. Some of your version will say openness and without restriction. So that's what the end of the book of Acts. It stops abruptly. So there's really no clue what happened to Paul as far as the Bible is concerned, except that if you, if you stop here, it seems like a happy ending. What happened to Paul? 
He was executed in Rome. Yeah. Okay. So that one we have to go to extra biblical records. A lot of scholars believe that after these two years he was released. He in fact he there was a fourth missionary journey because the book of Romans does talk about him going to Spain. Then after that he was in prison and later executed under the rule of Emperor Nero. He was not crucified because he was a Roman. Peter was crucified. He was beheaded, executed in Rome itself. That's the end of Paul, Paul's life. Prison itself. You know, Paul actually wrote about 13 epistles. Some they say not him, some say describe some. Yeah. But he has written quite a lot of letters. So what we cannot find in the book of Acts, we may find in his writings. We may find. So he wrote seven of the epistles when he was in prison. And we can see that when Paul was in prison, his writings had the, the nature, the attitude, the behavior, the characteristics of Paul seems to have matured and changed and become wiser. Instead of that bold Paul that was willing to speak up, an impatient Paul who discarded Mark and didn't want to have Mark with him in the journey, in, during his imprisonment, it seems like Paul had learned a little bit of patience and tolerance. But there is information though from his letters, personal letters, to indicate his attitude towards suffering and towards accepting his purpose and his destiny. And what are some of them? There are many, many verses in his epistles. Epistles are letters which he writes to churches, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. He will write to them or Timothy. And, and especially when he was in prison, he would write to encourage, to rebuild, to advise, and also to share some of his thoughts. And in Philippians itself, Philippians is known to be the happy church. This is his declaration. And Philippians was written when he was in prison in Rome. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me or gives me strength. How many of us know this verse already? Verse Philippians 4.13. And we always use this verse only. Only this verse. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So we use it in terms of motivation. We use it in terms of our career. We use it when we are going into competition because we say, I can do everything. But if you really read the, the verse in context, it's not talking about that. The verse in context is talking about going through every situation, whether it's good or bad, whether it's full stomach or empty, little or everything, every situation, God gives me the strength to go through. It doesn't mean like the prosperity gospel says that we will always prosper if we are Christians. No, sometimes God allows us to go through storms, hurricanes, financial, personal, relational storms. But whatever it is, he says, I have learned to be contented. This is in the earlier verse. I have learned to be content with what I have. Everything I have, whether it's good or bad, little or much, God or Christ will give me strength to go through it. This is his final feelings and emotions. And if you really want to read his real emotions, you go to 2 Timothy. Writing to Timothy himself. Timothy is one of his young disciples. And this is like towards the end already when he writes a letter to Timothy who is in Ephesus. For I am already being poured out like a dream offering and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Thank you. Thank you. So this is at the end. He knows he's going to die already. He says, I'm already poured out like a drink offering, but it's okay. The time of my departure is there. Perhaps his day of execution is nearing already, perhaps. And he says this, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race, yet I have kept the faith. Can we even say these kind of things or not? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Some of us are young. 
some of us are at the end of our lives already. Some of us are nearing the end of our lives. Some of us are in mid middle age. Some are still young. But for Paul, at this age, this is about 30 years, 30 years of ministry. 30 years, this is about 60 plus maybe. 30 over years of ministry and he knows he's going to die. And this is, he's confident. And he says, doesn't matter. I have fought the good fight. Because why? Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, the one I met in the road to Damascus, will award me on that day day and not only me but also to all who have longed for his appearing you see paul was a believer in the resurrection not in the immortality of the soul where when you die you go to heaven and this verse clearly says that he says that now i know i'm going to die but i know i'm going to get my reward but it's not immediate it will be on that day the resurrection day which he's going to talk about in first thessalonians not only to me but everyone, including us, who long for his appearing, who have fought the good fight, who have finished the race, the crown of righteousness is waiting for us when Jesus comes. That is his promise. That's how he maintained himself. He had the confidence. He wasn't scared of death. He wasn't scared of Kaiser. He wasn't scared of anybody because he knows that God is with him. You know, at the end of his life, he, he died quite lonely, man. And verse 9, he talks, he's talking to Timothy. He says, make every effort to come to me soon. See, even at the end of his life, he was mentally prepared, emotionally, physically, as a man, he still felt very lonely and very cold. And he says, make every effort to come to see me soon, Timothy. I want to see you. Because you know why? Verse 10, Demas deserted me. Some of his followers deserted him. And then some of them, like Christian and Titus, they have gone out to do evangelism, to do his work. Only Luke is with me. That's why Luke can write so clearly. Because Luke was with him all the way, from Ephesus all the way to Jerusalem, all the way. And then he says this in verse 11, get Mark and bring him. That's why you can see the tone of Paul has changed in prison. Mark is the guy he rejected earlier and quarreled with Barnabas and split. Now, Mark has flourished to become a great disciple, changed his attitude, grown up. Now, Paul wants to see him. Verse 13, Timothy, please bring my coat. It's getting winter. It's going to be cold. Alexander the coppersmith, the famous Alexander, has done me great harm. Earlier, he cursed Alexander. Now, change of tone, the Lord will repay him in keeping with his deeds. So God puts us in situations perhaps to train us to build our character from boldness now to love, to love and dependence on God. I commit him to the Lord that will repay him. Because Alexander the coppersmith had really, really disrupted and attacked Paul a few instances. We will read it in the epistles. And in verse 16, I still have two minutes. Even during his first defense in Rome, everybody tabooed, just the same as Jesus. Right? All his disciples left him, same as Paul. No one appeared in my support. Instead, they all deserted me. Sometimes that's what happens to older missionaries, even our older pastors. So I always believe that if there are older pastors, retired pastors, we as members and believers, should continue to support them, a bit of comfort, encouragement, because it's very lonely. <laughs> it's a very lonely journey for missionaries, pastors, evangelists, workers of God. But mm -hmm. of course, for him, Servant 17, the Lord stood by him, me and strengthened me, so that through me, the message could be proclaimed for the Gentiles to hear. And he was delivered. So Paul's life, no doubt it was treacherous, it was hard, but he was fully protected by God. So to end this whole book, here's Paul, the great apostle, the greatest apostle, I believe, evangelist, soldier of Christ, soldier for Christ. A man who understood how to keep the law. You can see that he continued to keep the law while saved by grace, by 
So he continued to keep the law while he understood the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the lawgiver. So we can actually keep the law as well as be saved by grace. It's not I law, it's one plus one. And that's the for us to live as Christians, is the grace of God allows us to keep the law in obedience to him. So that on the day when he comes, all of us will be ready. And we will also meet Paul and say, hey, Paul, I know you. And we will receive our crown of righteousness as well. So is it a happy ending? I believe so. Maybe not in the book, but when the day comes, when Jesus comes. I hope